Hi everyone, and welcome to Lecture 7 of CRMJ 201. Today we're going to finish up talking about biological theories of crime, and we're going to go through some of the major areas in terms of psychological theories of crime. Alright, so let's start off basically where we ended the last lecture, which is talking about biological theories of crime. Now, in modern biological study of criminal behavior, um, most of the focus is on two different, two main areas here. Um, neurological factors, factors that pertain to brain activity and how different kinds of brain activity might be related to criminal activity, and biological harms. So these are things biologically that might impact you either in your development or in your diet or in your hormonal functioning any of those kind of biological elements which might play a role in criminal activity. So what we're going to go through first are some of the basic neurological factors that people are interested in in the study of crime. First off is a person's brain activity and whether or not different types or levels of brain activity might be related to crime. Then there are a couple other areas, neurochemical factors which might impact crime, and in this area, a lot of what we're talking about are different levels of neurotransmitters and whether or not faulty, faulty levels and faulty operating of neurotransmitters has to do with crime. And then we'll talk about the autonomic nervous system and what role that plays. We're also going to talk today about some of the biological harms that people have identified as being potentially um, causal in leading people to commit crime. So for these, the three basic ones that people have talked about, and really the main one that we're going to talk about today, uh, are the perinatal harms. So these are, these are risk factors that occur at or around the time of a person's birth. All right, so let's start out by talking about some of these neurological factors. And I want you to keep in mind as we go through this that these are biological correlates of crime. Again, we've, we've talked about what a correlate means. It's not suggesting that any of these one things is a definite main cause of committing crime. But what we do know about some of these biological correlates of crime is they do tend to be very highly present in people who have a long history of criminal activity. So what we're interested in understanding is why these things are correlated together and whether or not there is any causal structure at work. So first we'll talk about neurological factors. Okay, the first area in terms of neurological factors in crime has to do with our understanding of brain activity and how brain activity might have something to do with a person's committing crime. Most people who are interested in studying this focus on the, prefor for, excuse me, the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And for any of you who have had, a, had any introduction to psychology or biology classes, you should have a basic idea that the prefrontal cortex is where people believe that our executive functioning takes place. Now executive function relates to abilities, for example, to differentiate among conflicting thoughts. Um, we believe that executive functioning is where we determine things that are good and bad. Um, and you know, in executive, the executive functioning area of the brain, which we believe is the prefrontal cortex, this is where we think that we develop the ability to understand the implications of our actions. So we develop in the prefrontal cortex and with executive functioning the ability to determine the future consequences of our actions, the ability to make long-term planning, setting goals, um, expectations based on actions. Um, basically what we think is this is the area of the brain not only that contains our ability to maintain attention on something but also where we kind of monitor our behaviors where we make the decision whether or not to act based on impulse so the ability to control our inhibitions. All of this stuff is what we think is happening in the prefrontal cortex of the brain and for those of you who have ever seen a model of a brain, we think that this is right in the front of a person's brain. So almost, almost right in back of your forehead is where we think the prefrontal cortex exists. Now, studies have been done to try to examine whether or not prefrontal cortex activity has anything to do with criminal activity. 
because you can imagine if somebody has lower levels of activity in their prefrontal cortex, they might not be able to control their inhibitions as well. They might not be able to see the good and the bad, the future consequences of activities. So in other words, faulty or low activity in the prefrontal cortex might have something to do with a person committing crime. Scientists have looked at this in two different ways. The first way is through PET scans, and you don't really have to know the specifics of what a PET scan is. Uh, PET, PET scan, uh, PET stands for positron emission tomography, and you know if any of you have ever seen any, any, any PET scans, these are things that look essentially like the images that you see on the right hand side of the slide right now, where when a person is showing activity in a part of the brain, it lights up and higher amounts of activity have deeper and deeper colors. So what people have, have, done, have done with PET scans in the study of crime, uh, a famous example is a study that was done examining the PET scan activity of murderers, people who are in prison for committing murder, and comparing them to people out in the normal public who have not committed murder. So what the scientists did is they gave murderers and normal others um, a bunch of different types of mental activities to kind of test their prefrontal cortex functioning. And this is one example uh, from this study, the, the two pictures that you see to the right on this PowerPoint slide. And the PET scan of the person who's in prison for murder is the one on the far right. And then you can compare that to the normal non-murderer uh, PET scan, which is the one on the left. And what you should notice there is that the prefrontal cortex, which is the, the area at the top of both of those pictures, has a lot of differences. Specifically, the murderers seemed to have much less activity in their prefrontal cortex. So biological criminologists would look at that picture and say, this is evidence that people who commit cr such heinous, terrible crimes, which most of us would never allow ourselves to do, there might be something about their inability to control the, their impulses and their inhibitions. Um, so that's, that's one example of a type of study where people believe they found a link between brain activity and crime. Another type of study that gets done are using MRIs. So that uh, MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And basically what MRIs give you is instead of this kind of tomography um, image, it, MRIs give you an actual 3D image of a brain's anatomy. And people use these MRIs to see whether or not people with certain types of criminal activity or deficiencies have less gray matter, less actual material in that prefrontal cortex. The idea being, if you have less material there, that might impact this executive functioning. And not a lot of studies have been done with this yet in terms of an actual criminal population. But uh, an interesting study got done a few years ago where they measured people who had what we call antisocial personality disorder. APD is how I abbreviate that. And that, that's a psychological diagnosable disorder. Not necessarily everyone who has that becomes criminal, but uh, a lot of criminals do are able to be diagnosed with something like it. And what they found is that people with this disorder, antisocial personality disorder, seemed to have less gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. So again, scientists who believe that there's a link between brain activity and crime would take that as possible evidence that it might be the case that people who commit crime do so because they don't have as much ability to control themselves, monitor themselves. They don't have as much executive functioning because of deficiencies in the prefrontal cortex. So that's kind of, we're really just scratching the surface here of what we, of, of what we're able to do with this new kinds of imaging and science to examine brain activity and crime. Um, the studies that I've mentioned to you, there are very few and they're very expensive to do, so there haven't been very many of them. But it will be interesting, especially for you guys moving, you know, into the future if you keep studying criminal activity. I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not more studies like this come out and brain functioning can be much more closely studied with respect to whether or not people have differences and whether or not those differences matter in terms of committing crime. Okay, the second biological area 
that we're going to go over is the link between neurochemical deficiencies and the problems with a person's autonomic nervous system and whether or not that has anything to do with committing crime. Now, when we're talking about neurochemical deficiencies, what people are most interested in in the study of biology and crime is whether or not faulty or inactive or problematic neurotransmitter levels have anything to do with criminal activity. Now the main one here, this is a whole area of, of science, and I don't want you guys to feel like you have to memorize too many chemical names. Um, so really the one that we're going to focus on for class, for this class um, today is the link between serotonin levels and potential behavioral traits. Now for those of you who have ever seen commercials about you know pills that are going to help target depression um, or other psychological ailments, uh, a lot of times they talk about things like levels of dopamine and levels of serotonin. And serotonin especially is one that criminologists, especially biological criminologists, really believe has a link to criminal behaviors because of its link to impulsivity and aggression. So we know that people who have low levels of serotonin on a, on a daily basis are much more likely to behave impulsively, they're much more likely to behave aggressively. So again, not necessarily committing crime, but if you have heightened levels of impulsivity and you're a more aggressive person in general, that certainly puts you at a higher risk to commit certain types of crime. So that's an example of an area where criminologists are showing an interest in study. If somebody who displays a lot of impulsivity and aggression, if, if it would be possible to treat them with um, things that might impact their levels of serotonin, you know, that, that you could see that as a relevant policy implication from this kind of research. If we can actually help to change levels of aggression by targeting neurotransmitters, that would be a very real policy outcome from this research. The other area that people have gotten interested in in terms of biological factors has to do with our autonomic nervous system and whether or not um, anything about how our autonomic nervous system functions has to do with crime. So again, <laughs> back to intro biology, um, the autonomic ner nervous system kind of acts like your control system in your body. It affects things like your heart rate, your digestion rate, metabolism, respiration rate, uh, the rate at which you salivate, the rate at which you perspire, um, sexual arousal, all of these things get um, maintained and monitored and affected by your autonomic nervous system. So most of these actions are involuntary, but some, such as breathing, kind of working tandem with the conscious mind. And the suggestion has been that when you actually measure people who you know have committed serious persistent chronic levels of crime, if you measure things that are an output of the autonomic nervous system, criminals seem to be operating at somewhat of a lower rate of a lot of a lot of things that the autonomic nervous system controls. For example, one suggestion has been that criminals have a lower resting heart rate. In other words, it takes a lot more activity and excitement to get a criminal's heart rate up, whereas a normal person would get excited and anxious and scared over much lower levels of, of materials. So the idea here is, if you're a person who has a very low resting heart rate, and it takes a lot for you to basically get aroused in any way, you might have to commit more and more serious actions to get a thrill or a rush or to get excited or scared or afraid. So the idea is that the reason why criminals commit these serious acts, these, these serious, heinous, problematic acts, is because they need to do those kind of things to experience the rush and the excitement and thrill that most of us do from more pro-social activities. Uh, there's a really good um, quote from the movie Silence of the Lambs, if any of you have ever, have ever seen it, where the psychiatrist who is describing uh, Dr. Hannibal Lecter to the FBI agent says to her that his pulse, Dr. Hannibal Lecter's, never got above 85, even when he ate her tongue. And that's a good example, I mean it, it sounds silly because it's from a movie, but it's a good example of what, of what we're talking about here. The fact that this person who we come to find out in the movie is a, a serial killer who commits all kinds of terrible heinous acts, didn't ever seem to get aroused and excited in the way that you would think he would given what he was doing. So that's, that's a, an example of 
a suggestion in film of the autonomic nervous system being being affected by by um, or, or not being able to be affected in the same way as normal people. Again, very early research in this area. It's it's hard to actually convince prisons and other places where you can get a large body of you know, known offenders, it's very hard to convince people to allow these kind of scientific biological tests to get done. But we do have some early initial evidence that it does seem to be the case that people who are have been incarcerated for long periods of time in their life have different levels of sweating, example, in stressful situations. Have don't their hands don't shake as much under pressure. They have a lower resting heart rate. And the idea being these are people that need more. They need more stimulation in their lives to get a normal amount of excitement.